We start today with NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. Way too early host and Politico's White House bureau chief Jonathan Lemire and former Republican congressman and MSNBC political analyst David Jolly. Welcome all to Ryan. <laughs> An all-nighter. Uh, this was like, you know, the last days before final exams. The bill had overwhelming support in the Senate. Majority Leader Schumer telling you that he's confident there's enough support in the House. How much pressure does that put on the Speaker? And do they have the votes? 218 votes is a high bar. Yeah, I mean, uh, Andrea, I think that that's the hope that the majority leader Chuck Schumer has, that uh, the, the fact that 22 Senate Republicans supported this legislation uh, would be a message to the House Speaker Mike Johnson that he at least needs to give this package its opportunity to get an up or down vote on the floor. But just based on Johnson's initial reaction to this package, the skepticism uh, that he seems to be applying to it, it seems unlikely that it'll just be that simple, that they'll just put the bill on the floor. Uh, and let the members decide. There's the possibility that they attempt to change it in some way with a, a level of amendments connected to it or that they break it up into individual pieces and put those on the floor. I think all that's a, a possibility right now. But obviously any of that would complicate this matter greatly. And it took so much work to get to the point where they could pass this legislation in the Senate that any additional changes to it in the House make it even that much less likely of getting finally passed and the given the opportunity to the president uh, to sign it into law. So uh, this was no doubt an incredibly big hurdle that this legislation uh, passed over uh, in the early morning hours here on Capitol Hill, but it still has a very uphill battle uh, in the House of Representatives, a, 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 a hill I should point out right now that seems very murky at best, Andrea. And David, discharge petitions are really, really rare because it requires 218 votes. Most House votes pass shy of that. Um, do you think it'll work this time? Will Donald Trump again intervene, block a legislative win for the president, and also, uh, I guess, block attempt to take down the speaker? Yeah, Andrea, I'm, I remain a skeptic that a discharge petition with this Republican House ever will work, particularly on this legislation, because it requires several Republicans to break from their own party. Now, what what is it going in favor of a discharge petition, frankly, are the enormous numbers of Republican retirements. And some of them are you're somewhat relatively mainstream. They're still MAGA, but they understand governing, some appropriators that are leaving, some chair chairs of committees who are leaving. Do they say, look, hating Ukraine and Israel is just so important. I'm willing to break with my party now. I'm not standing for reelection. Andrea, the best thing that could happen to Speaker Mike Johnson is a discharge petition because then he's not responsible for bringing it up for a vote. But absent a discharge petition, this is the quandary for Speaker Johnson. It would be up to him to bring up a vote on legislation that overwhelmingly Democrats will provide the votes to pass, and he just doesn't seem like he's going to do that. I'm, I'm very worried. Sometime today we're going to hear the words dead on arrival. And at that point, I don't know where the House and Senate go with this critical funding for our, for our allies. And Jonathan, you've heard from the president today in a statement urging the House to move on this, saying we cannot afford to wait any longer. The costs of inaction are rising every day, especially in Ukraine. Uh, is, what is he doing? Is he reaching out to people? I can recall, you know, previous presidents bringing them up one by one, working them over. You know, they've got some leverage. A lot of these House and Senate members in particular are going to Munich uh, towards the end of the week, Thursday. They're going to face... Ukrainian leaders, they're going to face the world opinion, NATO leaders, you know, and you've got hostage deal in play, Israel's in play. There's, there's so many deadlines here. Yeah, there really are. President Biden, of course, has been consistent throughout this process, calling for Congress to act, saying that the United States must be good keep its word. It needs to fulfill its obligations. And it made a promise to Ukraine to be there until the end of the war. And now that seems really in doubt. And we are getting reports by the day about the, the turn, the tide of war turning a little bit in Russia's favor, that they've been able to reclaim some territory from the Ukrainians. And there's 
desperate need from Kyiv to get more supplies and ammunition. And soldiers literally running out of bullets right now. Um, the White House, in, after the first summer of 2021, where they were dealt some legislative defeats, they have found that they've been more successful taking sort of a hands-off backseat role, that the president, if he's out there too much, too lobbying too much inten intensively to Republicans, that would actually turn them off, that it would be easier for them to oppose something that President Biden so desperately wants. Certainly, some of his senior aides, Steve Reschetti, senior counselor, Jeff Zients, the chief of staff, I think they'll be making entrees to Congress, you know, certainly particularly Republicans who are try represent Biden districts that the president won back in 2020. Um, but there's not great optimism here uh, from the West Wing aides that I speak to. They don't believe Speaker Johnson will act in good faith here in their estimation. They seem that it's un probably unlikely that he'll bring a vote to the floor, a discharge petition, as you just noted, also a tough hill to climb. Um, and, and then there, there are real concerns about what that means on the, the world stage uh, in terms of for Ukraine and also other American allies and adversaries alike looking at this and wondering what the U.S. really stands for going forward. That said, they're also in domestic political aspect. They feel like this is an issue they can use to go after Republicans and say, look, the GOP, they walked away from the border deal and now they're abandoning our allies. And David Jolly, there's a special election today in a very snowy New York congressional district in Long Island yeah. to fill the seat held by disgraced former Congressman George Santos. If Democrats flip that seat, it narrows Speaker Johnson's already slim majority. It's in single digits. Yeah. Even further, you were first elected in a similar special election in Florida. You held the seat for the Republicans against an Obama victory that year. What's your prediction today? Yeah, well, look, the polls show that Democrats are positioned to do well. This is one of the districts that Jonathan mentioned that Joe Biden had won. But this race, sure, it's about tonight. And does Speaker Johnson have a two-seat majority or one seat? But it is all about November. I can tell you what has been happening in that race is the national parties and all of the outside groups are message testing for November. It's why you see the issue of immigration in that district being the number one issue in this race. It's because the national parties want a message test. And, and they will learn from their mistakes. They will learn what didn't work and they will learn what works. If Democrats indeed take back this seat, like we have seen them perform in special elections, frankly, since the Dobbs decision, that is a very good signal for Democrats going into November. If Republicans hold it, it suggests for Democrats you, you still have some work to do.